Hey, what's going on guys? I'm Sean J. Harris here at Generational Wealth Academy. Happy Monday morning to everybody, Saturday number two. Listen, today I wanna to talk about working hard versus smart. I know you guys hear me talk about this a lot, but I really wanna break this down and allow you to have a different thought process and mindset as it relates to not having to work necessarily hard, but to start working smarter. So listen, I wanna share a little bit. I was listening to ET this morning, Eric Thomas, and he was talking about it's never too early. So I can resonate with this talk because that's the one thing that Tara and I consistently talk about when we travel around the world giving keynote talks. We talk about starting early. So many times people will ask, well, when should a kid learn financial literacy? When should a kid become uh, business savvy and start learning acumen as it relates to finances and entrepreneurship? And before they can even get the sentence completely out, I interrupt them and say as soon as they can talk. Because I understand that most kids around three or four years old, they know the latest dances, they know all of the lyrics to all of the songs. So why not start teaching them what an asset is, what a rate of return is, what a liability is, what a Roth IRA account is. Their minds are ready to receive it, so you're never too young to understand and to learn about success. So let's talk about working hard versus working smart. So again, you guys hear me say it a million and one times, if hard work was the key to becoming successful or wealthy, every construction worker will be successful or wealthy because they work truly work hard so it's not about working hard it's about leveraging what you have access to your resources uh connections that you have network uh, will equal your net worth so it's your network that's going to help you uh, in establishing these things so we always want to learn from other people's mistakes that shortens your learning curve. So let me give you a genealogy of my family history. You guys hear me talk about being, uh, our family owned the first two African-American owned hotels, my parents own companies, Tara and I own multiple companies, and now subsequently you see our children own multiple six-figure companies. So let me walk you through this here real quick. I'm, I'm gonna work from lowest level working back in history. So you guys see Kenny and Katie. They both own uh, multiple companies. Kennedy has a capital investment firm. She also owns a health and wellness company. Caden has a capital investment firm and he also owns a financial literacy company, consistent with his financial literacy bus as well. Tara and I own multiple companies. So Kennedy and Caden, they work smart, they work diligently, they work strategically. Tara and I, we don't work hard. We work methodically, systematic, strategically. Now, my dad, my mom, entrepreneurs. Now, my dad didn't necessarily work hard. Now keep in mind, that generation is where it started winding down as far as you gotta work hard. But my dad worked more so busily than hard. So, he worked for a major copier company back in the 70s and 80s, in the 90s. Uh, he segued off and he started his own company in the same industry. So he would burn a candle at both ends. He would go to work at his regular nine to five, he'd get off work, and then he'd go service his customers in the evenings and late afternoons. So at one point, he was able to get to the point and say, look, I'm making more money in the evenings part-time than I'm making all day on my nine to five. So he blew the nine to five end of the candle out. So it wasn't that he was working hard, it's just that he was working long and busyness until he was able to burn the other end of the candle out, which gave him his time and money freedom. Now, my granddad worked for Colonial Bread Company back in the 50s and 60s. Um, he was a manager, but he worked hard, okay? Now, I'm gonna use a little language for impact in this talk, because I think a lot of times people don't succeed in life because you're being talked to too softly. A lot of people, you need to be talked to in a certain way for it to resonate and to shape you, to move into action. So I may say a little language here, just go with the flow, we're, we're grown. If you're on this site, you should be grown. Um, if not, it'll be okay. So, um, my kids don't work hard, they work smart. Tara and I, we don't work hard, we work smart. My dad, he worked long, but he worked smart. My granddad, who worked for Colonial Bread Company here in Atlanta back in the 50s and 60s, he worked hard. Okay, 
because that's the way that generation was. It was post-World War II. It was work hard, work hard, work hard to get ahead. Then my great-granddad worked fucking hard because he was a farmer. He, he tended to a farm all day. He had a couple horses, he had cows, he had goats, pigs, chickens, you name it. But he ran a very successful farm. My great granddad built his own house by, with his own hands. He built the house. So he worked very hard. He also ran a moonshine business too. Now, my great granddad worked my great-great-granddad worked even fucking harder, okay? So, here's what I'm trying to convey to you, and I know I use the T word, which I never do. Please forgive me. But as generations go back further and further, they work fucking hard. And it's not about working hard. The more we progress forward generationally, the less harder we should work and the more leveraged we should work, the more smarter we should work. So that goes back to the beginning of my talk. It's all about starting early. It's never too young to learn. Eric Thomas talked about in the piece that I listened to this morning, a little kid from India won a speaking uh, spelling bee. He won like $20, or 25 bucks. E.T. asked him, well, what did you do with the money? He said, I invested it in a book. He said, well, whose book did you invest in? He said, it was yours. So it's all about early investment and never thinking that you're too young, you're too early. You guys remember growing up, you would always see things that are age appropriate. It says for 12 and up, for five and older, for adults only. Who ever made up that rule? Who told you that you had to be a certain age to learn a certain thing? See, many times people always ask, well, what are you gonna do when you grow up? Why do you have to wait to grow up to, to do or become? Oftentimes people ask Kenny and Kane, well, what are you gonna do when you grow up? Listen, they're six-figure business earners now at age 13 and 14. Why would they change? If they're already making more money than college graduates now at their ages, why would they shift gears and do anything different? See, so a lot of times we have to see what works. We have to be open-minded to be able to understand paradigm shifts to say, hey, look, maybe we can do this different in the subsequent generations. Maybe it worked hard for my generation, my parents' generation, my great-grandparents' generation. Why do we need to make it hard for the, previous, uh, for the uh, subsequent generations and the present generations? Your job as a parent should be, or a grandparent, is to be able to build your children and put them in a position where they start life out on third base. We believe in giving our kids the fair, unfair advantage. I'm a big baseball fan, I love baseball. So again, if I start out with my kids on third base, I have no strikes, no outs, first batter up. Anything I do at the plate barring a strikeout, I should be able to score those kids. If I hit a pop fly deep enough in the uh, outfield, they're gonna tag and they're gonna score. If I hit a base hit, they're gonna score. If I hit a slow grounder, between first and second, they'll score. Even if I strategically place a bunt down the first baseline, they're gonna score. But if, if I did strike out at the plate, guess what? We still got two more batters up. So the propensity of them being able to score is extremely high. So that's the same thing we have to do for our kids and our grandkids. We have to be able to set them up to start life on third base so that you know they're gonna get the score. So. The biggest thing I want you to take away here this morning, because I want to give actionable steps. You know, many times I, I hear people who ask millionaires, well, how did you do it? Oh, it's just hard work and just, listen, nobody want to hear that. That doesn't help people move the needle. People want to know actionable steps. So here is how I became a millionaire. I changed what I read. I changed my associations and I changed how I used my time. It's that simple. Those three changes allowed me to stop working hard and to start working smart, start working strategically, start operating on a system. S-Y-S-T-E-M, save yourself time, energy, and money. So don't strong arm everything, don't force it. I'm a strong guy, but I can't go underneath my kitchen sink and twist the pipe loose with my hand, but I can take a pipe wrench, connect it with minimal effort, I'll break the torque on the pipe. 
So again, that's the way we have to live our lives. You gotta position yourself to make life more simpler, make life easy. The talk I gave yesterday, I'm gonna close on this. The question was, would you rather have an 850 credit score, $5 million cash, or $60,000 weekly? And people were trying to break it all down and will analyze it. Well, if I do the credit, I can leverage this. If I do the $6,000, is that gonna be for my life? Listen, listen, it doesn't take rocket science. People overcomplicate things. At 850 credit score, that's great. But that just means you're gonna be able to buy things on credit which you still gotta pay back. The option of having 6K. And the person asks, well, is it for life or is it, does it matter? Does it really matter? Who said you're going to live past next week? Who said you're going to live to see the sunset today? So that's not a viable option. You take the five million today so you can now invest that into your legacy. So should something happen to you by the end of today, that five million is still in your family as an asset. That's the way you have to think. It's like investing. You got to figure out what's going to work for my family unit today because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You got to ask yourself, would you rather have 100% of a grape or 35% of a watermelon? Listen, a watermelon is this big. A grape is that big. So many times people are operating on that 100% ownership. This is all mine. Mine, 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 mine. But it's a small mine. I'd rather collaborate and earn 35% of a bigger unit than 100% of a small unit. So ask yourself in life, what can I do to move the needle? What can I do to shift and change and make a difference financially and more so with your time freedom? Because listen, it's Monday morning. Uh, I think it's probably about eight o'clock or so. People are on, on the highway right now. 285, I-20, 75, 85, north and south here in Atlanta. I don't mess with traffic. When there's things I do, if, especially if I have an appointment on Monday, I wait until 10 o'clock before I even think about leaving the house because I enjoy my time. I enjoy my money freedoms. So in moving forward, listen, we're about to end Q1 before you know it. We're at the end of February already. The year is flying by. A friend of mine just had a granddaughter. It's been a month ago now, but it seemed like the baby was just born a couple days ago. So time is really flying by. So position yourself to win in 2024. You can't go back to old thinking. You can't go back to old ideologies, the old ways of doing things. Because listen, if, if what you've done up until this point has not pleased you, it's not giving you the financial desires of your heart, that way of making money doesn't work and you got to change because we can't keep going forward. Think you're going to get a different result. All right, guys. So I hope that made major impact today. Uh, again, my whole purpose of coming on daily is to inspire you, is to give you actionable steps, not cliche stuff like, hey, just work hard. Just put your nose down and grind. And no, I'm giving you actionable steps to become wealthy. Actionable steps to become a millionaire if that's your desire. Many people don't need to become a millionaire to get time and money freedom. You may just need to make $150,000 a year to give you the time and the money freedom that you desire. But whatever it is, you got to figure out what your FIN number is, your FIN, your FIN number, your financially independent number. See, many times you may make $85,000 a year. You may feel that, well, I have to replace $85,000 a year to live the lifestyle I live. Not necessarily. You may only need to make $65,000 or $70,000 because you got to look at all the money that you incur to have a job. It costs to have a job. You got to pay for clothing, uniforms. You got to pay for food. You got to pay for transportation. You got extra maintenance on your vehicle. But if you deduct that because you're at home now, you may be able to save $15,000, $20,000. So your FIN number is the number that you need to be able to leave your job if that's what you want to do. Then you also have to know your lifestyle number. Your lifestyle number is what amount of money I need to be able to live the lifestyle I desire to be able to pull back from a job, have time and money freedom, and still have extra money to be able to do the cool things in life that you want to do. All right. 
All right, guys, I am about to get my hot chocolate for the morning. I don't drink coffee uh, and I'll do a talk on that. Why I don't drink coffee later on down the road. But um, I got some things I got to do uh, coming out of Good Morning America last week. We have been rocking. I'm talking about the well shop have not stopped for booking engagements for product purchases. And I'll talk about that later on in the week. I think Tara is going to go live with me. Um, and we're going to talk about more on how to leverage the media how to position yourself to get into media. Instead of just talking on one-on-one, -on -one, you go one from many. And we had no clue that they were gonna keep airing the Good Morning America story. So we can always tell when it's aired somewhere in the country because we get a large bump of inquiries on the websites. So stay on the journey with us. We're gonna walk you through the process because I don't believe in just telling you, I believe in showing you and what our family does, we show you in real time what we're doing. All right, guys, I'm Dr. Shonja Harris.